Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 211, also known as 211, also known as Dos Uno Uno. How you guys doing? Great. As you're well aware, for some of you that are watching today, it is now that hello day in the week for most of you weak-minded, soft-spined um, um, people out there who look forward to specific days in the week for you to get happy or for you to become happy, for you to be in a happier mood. It's now Friday. So wipe that, turn that upside down smile the right way around, right? Upside down to, yeah, well, turn that frown upside down and enjoy your day. It's Friday, mofos. It's Friday. The sun is shining slightly right now in the morning. It's not as overcast as it was previously, but I'm sure the weather will turn. But even if it does, don't worry about it. Make the most of your day. You've been looking forward to this day the whole week. Don't waste it. Because that's usually the most annoying thing about people that have that kind of um waiting for the day to change sort of thing. When the day comes around, you usually end up wasting it and end up kind of wallowing in your own self-pity, complaining about this and that and whatever it may be. If you're looking forward to the day, don't waste it. Go out there. Have some fun. I don't know. Go to a gallery. Oh, you know what's happening, actually? There's, um, isn't there the, uh, the, the, the RA Summer Exhibition, right? The Royal Academy. Um, that's out today. It's out until the end of the summer, really, based on the most part. I saw there was a Banksy piece of art that everyone's going crazy about. So I recommend you check that out. I that is, isn't it, right? Um... The summer exhibition, right? Summer exhibition. Is it RA? I'm pretty sure it's the RA summer exhibition. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's the RA summer exhibition. It's, it's going to be on at the moment. So if you're looking for something to do, or you're a bit, you know, you're a bit stumped, flummoxed, and you don't know what to do, you're like, oh, I'm bored. What should I do, Agostino? This is annoying. I have no other friends to go out with. Stop being a baby. Uh, pick up your breeches and get out there and see this thing here. It's called the... Let me get up here on the screen for you to check out. It's the summer exhibition. It's this lovely stuff here see that the summer exhibition 2019 royal academy of the arts um 10th of june to the 12th i think it's about 20 or 30 quid i think for the most part um following last year's record-breaking 250th summer exhibition our annual celebration of art and creativity continues in 2019 run without the interruption since 19 wow since 1769 the summer exhibition is the world's largest open submission art show i remember they used to do some really cool bbc documentaries about the people that did submit in um, their pieces of art for the summer exhibition so many interesting cool people from all different walks of life i love how they vote for the actual pieces that go up little they put little marks on the back of them it's really quick the process the assistants come they flag them up in front of people and they kind of pass it around i actually might get a video up here and we'll just quickly check it but it's really cool but let's continue reading this um Blah, 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 blah. prints and paintings, film photography, sculpture, architectural works, and more by leading artists, royal academies, royal academics, and household names, as well as new and emerging artists. This year's acclaimed British painter, John McFadden, RA, takes the mantle from Grayson Perry, who coordinated the 251 summer exhibition. Over 1,500 works are on display. Highlights include animal-themed Mirage in Central Hall, works by artists Polly Morgan, Charles Avery, Banksy, Matt Collinhall, artist sister Jane and Louis Wilson, Tracy Yemin, Jeremy Della, uh, Frank um, Bowell, Anthony Gormley, so many amazing people. James turrell has got a piece in there too. I'm interested in what that's going to look like in there because obviously his pieces are usually massive, isn't it? It's cool to see what that looks like. Let me get let me get that video up. Actually, there's a really cool video that kind of shows how they approve all the submissions. I remember seeing it on a BBC ages ago. I'm not sure if they still have it. Let me see if they have it. So it's the RA Summer Exhibition, right? Um, ex was that an entry? Entry requirements. Let me see if I can get it up here. RA. Uh, summer exhibition selection process selection process let's see if it's got it should have a little section process thing here that works out pretty well come on my 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 how long is it hope it's not too long quickly scan for it yeah two minutes let's quickly watch that one Dope, boom let's go so this is this is how they do the uh the, the selection of the piece of art that go in a summer exhibition The, the summer exhibition is selected, so this is on the screen in case you guys are listening. The summer exhibition is selected by a panel of Royal, Acad Royal Acad Academics. Um, each is practicing artist or an architect. Well, so they're in the field. Days. 
which is completely different to like you know the Grammys and all that sort of shit. And it's people that aren't even involved in the arts or do anything creative for themselves choosing what the best album is, which is you know a, a probably story for another day. But let's continue. I'm coming in and watching this fantastic team of helpers come by with hundreds and hundreds of paintings that goes on from ten in the morning through to five at night, and we're not looking for any particular kind of. Uh, painting at all, that we don't care you know, what sort of painting it is, but somehow it has to have... It's awesome, isn't it? You're tied to a hanging committee. ...exude some kind of confidence and feeling that it's part of um, a bigger world of art somehow. What we're, what we're really feeling is very, very happy when something just grabs our attention, even for a few seconds. We don't need minutes to ponder it. We can, all of us, the collective consciousness can say in a few seconds whether we something. If it doesn't appeal to all of us, there'll be enough people who it does appeal to. And my taste will be different from some of the other tastes, but I think generally speaking, we all know when something's good of its kind. I've been a judge before on, on quite a lot of print exhibitions, but just the scale of this is so much wow. better than I think I've ever judged before. And the speed with which you have to look and make a decision is a, is a bit mind-boggling. <laughs> so you you really can't even stop to, to sneeze, really, because you might miss something as it goes past. Oh, bless Anne. But, uh, as there's more eyes than just just mine on things, you do you do at least have that. Sense That's a pretty cool way of judging things. So they have the judges sitting down on the line um, in chairs side by side. Then they have the group of then they have all the artworks um, stacked up in little shelves behind them or little shelves, quite big shelves. Then they have a row of assistants in front of them who are passing the artworks along. So then I'm assuming because there's a lot of them sitting on the line, they can all individually pick which one they think is good. And then I'm assuming the the batch gets whittled down from there. So they have like an initial pick where they go and choose one and then they kind of pick down from there. Somebody else amongst those seven or eight other judges is go, are going to pick it up. At the end of each evening, I've, I've been feeling terribly tired. You don't <laughs> realise as you're looking at the things how how tiring it gets. That's I can imagine. Different visual stimulation. Yeah. You know, 3,000 or more works a day. <laughs> it's a bit mind-boggling. But interesting, hugely diverse been an enormous print submission this year, which I think may be to do with that both Peter Freeth and Norman Ackroyd and myself are all printmakers on the panel this year, and I think maybe a lot of artists have been very aware of that, so we've seen a huge range, a huge amount of prints, some very good prints, so for me that's been really gratifying to have such a good, strong print submission. I'm hoping that'll be exciting when it comes to laying out the galleries, hanging the walls. Anyway, that's basically what the summer exhibition is. Really cool. Um, it happens every summer in, in London. So if you're around and you're bored and you want to do something on a Friday, instead of going out drinking and you know burying your face in warm alcoholic beverages in the middle of London, why don't you buy a ticket, go to the Royal Academy and enjoy some nice bit of art. And even then after that, you can then go you know, across the river, get yourself a cocktail, go to one of those nat natural wine um, bars that are opened up all over London, or maybe go to a nice little tapas restaurant, whatever it may be, but kind of mix up a little bit, you know? Usually we all do the same sort of thing every Friday, go for a night out, you know, end up picking up some indiscriminate amount of you know, weird shit that we're going to shovel up our nose or drink some dumb beverages. Forget that for one evening. Go out, get some culture, enjoy yourself. Or maybe not. Maybe maybe you're like, you know, I guess, you know, you're not the master of me. You can't tell me what to do. I'll do what I want when I want when I please. Fair enough. You're a grown up. Do as you please. But I think my suggestion's quite cool. But anyway, regardless, um, that's on at the moment until when? RA Sum Exhibition is on from the eight, the 10th of June until the 12th of August, so plenty of time for you to squeeze that bad boy in. Anyway, let's get on to some topics, things I wanted to speak about, things that are on my mind, and then we're going to keep on moving. What's on here? So, number one. Um, well, oh, number one, actually, update on what I've been doing. I just came back from a gym, actually. I went to a gym in the morning. Later on, I'm going to go for a run, and then later on this evening, I'm heading off to Gay Paris. For a little weekend stint right i'm gonna go visit some friends um which is gonna be interesting because the first time i went to paris no i went to paris three or four times and i didn't really enjoy it then i went the the most recent time i went to go see virgil abloh's latest ex no his first exhibition in paris i think let me see if i can bring it up um off-white vogue runway this is my kind of first introduction to the whole paris life right uh, blah, 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 blah. I can get it up on here. Let's see if he's got all the exhibitions because I remember which one I went to go, I went to go and see, right? 
So let's see. He's got all the exhibitions here. I went to go see the one with the yellow screens. It was a menswear, sh menswear show in Paris, right? So I went three or four times. Never really enjoyed it. Out of the three or four times I went, I think half of those times were with my parents. So, you know, going to a city like Paris with your parents is, can get a bit old really quickly. Especially at that kind of age where you kind of want to do your own thing. Like, oh, my own man. I don't want to be hanging around mum and dad. You know, you've got that kind of weird rebellious shit going on in your head. But over time, you know, you kind of get over it. Um... But then you're like, you know what, maybe Paris just isn't my kind of city, you know, it's quite similar to London in that kind of regard in terms of how it's laid out, not really how it's laid out, it's more like the central of London, it's, you know, a small, color, a, a small, a, a densely populated cosmopolitan city, similar to London in that respect, so you kind of get a bit, ugh, it's not that big of a deal. But then I went back for this, right? I'm going to put this on the screen. I went back to see the Off-White show, 4016 menswear show, that's what I went to go see. Well, I remember the screen, this is the one where um, Ian Connor ran out towards the end. Um, so I went to go see this when I was in Paris and that's when everything changed for me. Obviously it helps that when I was going to Paris, I was going for work. So I think that gave it a little bit more of a, a different sort of sheen, right? I was a bit happy to, I was a much, I was in a much more of a happier mood. I felt like I was involved in the industry for once. I went from being a consumer to somehow being a participant in culture. I was meeting up with various buyers. I was going to showrooms. I was meeting up with various kind of, you know, cultural figures in the scene and stuff, you know, just moving and shaking. And then luckily I was able to get a, 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 a not a seat, but I was able to go and see the show. I didn't get a seat. I had to be standing along the side, but, I, you know, for the most part, everyone else was sitting down, so I got kind of a clear view of the models coming down the runway. And it was for the Off-White Fall Winter 2016 show from Virgil Abloh. Um, again, really cool, man, to go see the show. Really cool to go see everybody that I'm used to seeing in the scene and stuff like that. And just in general, just to be part of it, because I'm sure, you know, for most of us fashion people out there or people that are like, you know, watching runway shows. It's one thing to see stuff on Vogue runway. It's another thing to see that kind of stuff in real life. So I went, I saw the show, and after after the, after I saw the show, I then went to, um, where did I go to? I went to a couple after parties, a few of them. I went to an after party that I think, um, who was, who threw the after party? It might have been Acronym. The guys from Acronym might have threw the after party, but a few others. I went to quite a few after parties, hanged around, did the whole smooching thing, saw street star people. I saw how that kind of game goes, which was, you know, a little bit depressing, but also quite funny. And um, in general, I ended up kind of walking around the entire city for the most part, hanging out with some randoms. And I just really felt the vibe of it. We ended up doing some bar hopping, going to random restaurants, random bars. I ended up going to this sick little wine place. Oh, this sort of kind of cafe, I don't know, the standard sort of restaurant you see in Paris on the side of the street, like with great little outdoor patio, um, drinking wine. I bought cigarettes. I don't even smoke and just absorbed myself. Had a book in my hand, reading the same page for one hour and a half. I absolutely loved it. I fell in love with the city. I, it, I kind of got what everyone was talking about. And again, it reminded me a little bit of, this is a bit of a cringe example, but it reminded me a little bit of um, the movie with uh, Clive Owen, where it's in Paris. What's it called? Midnight in Paris? Is it Midnight in Paris? What's that movie called? Midnight in Paris. Is it called Midnight in Paris? Yeah, Midnight in Paris. Do you remember? That's the movie from, what's his director's name? Woody Allen. Uh, Clive Owen's in it. Um, amazing movie. I remember watching this back in the day. It had so many cool literacy, lip, lip, literary literary references loads of cool authors mentioned um loads of cool books i added to my wish list i ended up buying over time um yeah just an amazing woody allen movie for the most part um and that again gave and then that kind of made me remember that movie when i went there i was like oh this is why everyone falls in love with paris it's an amazing city to go and just peruse and you know get lost in and just enjoy yourself and kind of get absorbed by everything that's going around so yeah um i, I really enjoyed it so now i'm going a second time and I'm hoping it's going to be the same. We're going to stay with some friends. Um, kind of going to get to know them a little bit better. It's going to be just over the weekend. We're going to basically have the whole Saturday, whole Sunday to come around. We're going to arrive there later this evening and Friday. So we're probably not going to do anything. Probably end up just drinking and having a little chat. And then it's Friday, Saturday and Sunday, we end up going walking around and then coming back on Monday morning. So a little quick trip in between all things. Because I haven't really been abroad this whole year. I probably won't be abroad again, probably. The only thing I'll probably end up doing is going to Berghain. Or going, sorry, going to the Berlin, specifically to go to Berghain on one weekend. That's going to come up very soon. But I'm not going to do any kind of beach holidays or anything. So, you know, a little trip in between to kind of move things around is going to be very, very well re received on my end for the most part. But yeah, that's what I'm doing this weekend. I hope you guys are going to have fun. Anyway, um, let's move on to some topics. Get into some topics that I wanted to speak about this afternoon this morning wherever time it is wherever you are number one we've got the stefan janowski 
the absolute legend, the legend of Nike SB, the guy that kind of changed um, what it meant to have. What did happen with him, Stefanowski? The legend goes that he had a, and in, what did he have? He had like a, he had his own shoe. He really stuck to his guns. He ended up designing his own shoe from the ground up. And then he ended up taking a portion of the sales. But then it was selling so well, Nike didn't want to continue paying him that portion of sales. And so then he, he made them pay up. I don't know, close to four million or something stupid like that. He got paid out something dumb like four million dollars or something, and then now the Despies have been kind of absorbed into the the Johnskis have been absorbed into the general you know SB lineup. He doesn't get a percentage of them anymore, but he got kind of bought out of his contract, which was kind of insane for a skateboarder at that time. So you know, most skateboarders don't earn that kind of money unless you're like you know one of those cute skateboarders. So for Janoski to earn that kind of amount of money at this level of time is amazing. But also go speak to his influence. You know, you there was a period of time when everybody, everybody under the sun was wearing Stefan Janoski's. Man, I tried to wear them for a period of time, but unfortunately, my legs, my feet at the time were probably I'll be able to wear them now. But at the time, my feet were super flat. I didn't really have much of an art arch on my foot now because i've been training quite well and i've been wearing quite a lot of flat shoes what i train in um nike metcons i took out the insole um i do a lot of work deadlifting in bare feet i do a lot of work um doing my back squats on bare feet too positioning my feet in a certain way doing loads of exercise and mobility work so i've got a, a nice developed arch i probably could wear them nowadays but i remember just them being really flimsy really thin but if you re listen to his story it kind of goes back to what he kind of wanted in his overall shoe. And they've got a little documentary here that kind of speaks about um, what he basically done on um, Hype Beast I've mentioned here. Let me just pull this up. Um, we'll quickly check this out. Let me just put up in a new window actually to make this easier to check out. I'll load it on here. This is a little documentary from Stefan Janoski on Nike SB. 10th anniversary. Such a legendary stream, and I had like I don't know how many colorways of this I had, probably like four. Insane. It pissed off a lot of people. Went into a full rage <laughs> because they're like, "This doesn't look like a Nike shoe." <laughs> really good at being stubborn. His anger made him more sharp on what he wanted. I don't think he makes anything easy for anybody. It's so him because it genuinely came from him. Good for him that he stuck to his guns. That's pretty point for Rodriguez. Looks so, so much older, right now. Nike in. 2006 or seven or five yeah around that stefan at the time no was, he was on fire yeah nobody was skating like stefan's style he was absolutely the switch master he's tall and lanky long flowing hair and he has a penchant for wearing flowy clothes as well and i mean this in the nicest way it's kind of like a wet noodle. <laughs> That's a good description of him. You know, he's a very charming kind of like... Wow, look how much older Paul Rodriguez looks on P-Rod, man. P-Rod's a fucking legend. The amount of stick he got back in the day for being like one of the, you know... I don't know, he was probably one of the biggest... Probably one of the biggest commercial skateboarders out there. Who's the other kid, the white kid? I forgot his name. Um, The kind of Justin Bieber looking dude. Super ripped. But remember P-Rod, man. He was huge back in the day for kids, man. We used to be embarrassed to say we're fans of him, but we loved P-Rod, man. I know I did anyway. I loved P-Rod. He, he, he epitomized everything it was to be like a, a professional skateboarder. Um, He didn't, you know, he wasn't really about all the mess life. He just went around the competition, smashing those things, winning them, big cash prizes, bagging sponsors, keeping it moving, man. Absolute legend, Paul Rodriguez, man. Big up him. He looks so much older now, isn't it? It's <laughs> so cool. He'll be doing really high level difficult tricks and look like he's half asleep and everybody was just like we need to go after Stefan <laughs> he always had two three video parts a year for like a five six year period he was such a hot commodity we wanted to come up with the shoe very quickly yes. but yeah didn't work out that way Jay Mary's hey, we're gonna tune some more signature shoes and you're the next one what was the initial plan Oh, there was no plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of whipped the shoe out of the bag and he sort of looked at it. I don't like bulging toes on shoes. <laughs> said, no, flat toe, flat toe, flat toe. Awesome. Most athletes didn't have an aesthetic point of view. He had a different agenda. My shoe, my way. That's what I said. I don't care. I don't have a shoe now. And if you don't do it the way I want it, then I still won't have a shoe. It doesn't matter to me. I wish there was more athletes that did that or more um creative individuals and stuff i think you're seeing it nowadays i'm thinking i'm thinking of the likes of heron preston virgil abloh and matthew williams as, a, as an example right they're not skateboarders but you know those kind of and maybe even jerry lorenzo getting get involved too 
and um, Yoon from Ambush. And you're seeing a real difference. You're seeing a real change in what the creatives want to do with Nike in terms of shoes and apparel. Instead of going out there and just like rehashing a colorway or whatever, I think they're very aware that number one, they're probably the clientele they want to speak to. They're not necessarily sneakerheads, but they're going for the kind of fashion, design, creative, um, aspiring creative crowd who want something a bit different, like the Tom Sachs Miles Yard, whatever. It wouldn't have been fun if Tom Sachs just went and redesigned an Air Force One or changed the colorway. It wouldn't have been as more of an interesting project. But the fact that he went and kind of built a shoe from the ground up, uh, took the sole from an SFB, made a different upper, different kind of materials, made a sole that kind of absorbs dirt and kind of the more dirt you get, the better it looks. I think that's a new introduction we're seeing. Probably more, maybe it's a indication of the confidence the creatives have in their own work or maybe it's also a reflection of what the customer wants right they're no longer i think back then stefan joski could have easily got away with just do, doing a color of a blazer of a of match court low of a dunk low of a dunk mid and, and no one would have complained but i think nowadays that same level of attention would be even greater appreciated now because things are just so you know rehashed or retro looking but you have to give credit to people like matthew williams virgil um heron preston yoon from ambush um the girl from cactus plant flea market you know they're going for it and trying to reintroduce different introducing different models um upgrading them in a different way different kind of aesthetic not going for the easy kind of low-hanging fruit it takes a lot of courage to do that honestly Stefan Janowski's shoe has to be what Stefan Janowski says. Basically, he told us, this is not my shoe. I don't know how you came up with this. What were you thinking? We were both had different ideas. <laughs> Picked it up and looked at it, and he threw it back at us. I don't know. I love him. Like something out there. <laughs> what is this? That's not my shoe. Uh -huh. We really have to start from ground zero again. It's just a lot of phone calls, drawing, pictures. Stefan was, you know, a wild card. We went back and forth for a really long time. It took a while for them, I think, to realize, like, all right, this guy's not budging. What does he want again? His pet peeve was that skate shoes were too big, too puffy. As he skated, he couldn't feel the board. Stefan was very adamant about making a shoe that was paper thin. Skate shoes at the time were just... Yeah, that, that explains why I had so much trouble wearing them, because my big corn bunion -y riddled feet were just rubbing up against it i could feel the grip tape rubbing against my toe every flick every drag every pull was just fucking breaking me and of course without an arch as well my flat foot it just wasn't working so ex that explains it now it, at the time i thought it was, a I thought it was a design defect but now hearing his personality hearing how he speaks about things and hearing what he wants to feel on his shoes it makes complete sense Kind of like wearing a Kleenex box on your foot. Jesus Armored Christ. Armored tank type shoes mm. baked potatoes for your feet. Stubby toed, puffy suede potato. His first <laughs> sort of statement was, I want a shoe built with the least amount of material. Closest wow. to being a foot. We jump off big sets of stairs, big gaps, big grinding out, big hand rows. We're taking a lot of impact. So people were trying to find the indestructible shoe. But the only problem with the indestructible shoe is you want to have a real close connection with your board. You have these bulky, heavy shoes. Just came with his own set of issues. <laughs> the closer my feet are to my skateboard, the more connected I feel. Wow. The shoe parts just make your foot look good. But the foot is really what helps you skate. That's cool, man. For him, it really was, I want to feel the board scraping across my foot. I want my ankles look how good they look. bloody. I want a shoe that's going to make my foot bleed. I want my foot to bleed. What a statement to make. I want my foot to bleed for the time. Imagine being the creators out there when you're making that shoe and he's telling you, I want my foot to bleed. You're like, uh, okay, I guess. <laughs> to the factory, flew out to Asia and just started building something. The trick with skateboarding is a very abusive sport on the shoes, so we needed to create a shoe that was both durable as well as minimally built. Some of the things I would say in, the, in my temper tantrum like, you are Nike. You can do anything. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Hey, oh, he said that? Great. Mm. He definitely had a temper tantrum about it. That's mm -hmm. why I was so hard on them, because I knew that they could make the best shoe ever. Look how clean that looks, look man. Like a Nike looks one. beautiful, doesn't wow. it? It was completely out of left field. Yeah. At the time, they were trying to push technologies and all our studies and research yeah. and development. There was a lot of very expensive looking technical shoes. Multiple airbags. Exactly. So for that to come at that time, that was really revolutionary. System fused to the outside of the shoe. Futuristic looking mesh and rubber. And Stefan's shoe had none of that. Yeah, exactly. You said you wanted it low as possible. We worked with the factory to get it so low that they said it was illegal to produce and we had to sign a bunch of 
that's cool. We'll see. That, illegally low. <laughs> we're just about to shoot. Our bosses brought all of us into the office, and the reaction was terrible. They hated it. They had other pro athlete shoes up there that look $200 to $300, and you know, we we're coming out with a $75 shoe using a 100 year old technology. I love Sausum, t h o u One of my first tasks was organizing the launch party for the shoe. And Stefan had this list of demands that dancers and say yeah. doves to be released upon his entrance. <laughs> Synth on tap. Unbelievable. They assumed that it would tank. They bought so light that it became a rare commodity, not by strategy, but because of fear. Okay, that makes sense, because I remember that too. I remember them being really hard to get the first drop around. I think I got the first batch. I remember, I think I was working at 1948 when they first released, I'm pretty sure. And I remember trying to get a pair from Slam City Skates, not being able to get them. And I remember, I think for, I don't know why, but I remember we having, we got some as well in 94. Yeah, I don't know why we had some in the store, but we ended up having some.、Um, they're really hard to come by, especially the, the standard black pair that was sort of like navy looking. I remember that being super hard to get. So that explains it. It wasn't even a strategic thing. They just weren't, they weren't really sure they were going to sell well. Okay. Gun, trying to get it done, but also making sure that Stefan was happy as well. That pressure. Produce greatness. When did you know that you had something special? I think it was when Stefan didn't give our shoe back. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. We had to have the factory remake another sample while Stefan was skating. First sample was like, yeah, it's perfect. You know? Wow. Yeah, I don't think I gave him that. <laughs> it just started picking up and picking up, and by the second year, it became bigger than we thought.、Mm. Third, fourth year, we're like, what's going on? It started taking over the rest of our business.、Mm. It became a massive hit. It was selling really well. I'm pretty sure he got bought out of his contract, didn't he? I'm pretty sure they're going to mention that one. Probably not. Me personally, and the small team that worked on the shoot, we loved it. So good. It was a shoe that we felt. We wanted to wear. We knew the skateboarding community would gravitate towards it because it was so special. It was about the craft and the make of it. It was one of those shoes that as soon as you lay your eyes on it, you know it's a home run.、Yeah. I can't really emphasize enough how important it was for us to create our own unique shoe. Up until that point, our biggest successes were vintage shoes. Yeah, I think、shit. what it did was it shifted the paradigm of what an athletic shoe could look like. It was Stefan fighting for what he believed in. At Nike, they have a wall. There you go, man. The top 100 shoes. And Stefan's shoe sits on that wall. Wow. It is within the There、room. you go, man. That, that's a lesson learned for all creators out there. Stick to your guns, no matter what people say in the beginning. Especially if it's. I think the, the point of this story would be not so much stick to your guns in the hope that you're going to become Stefan Janowski and have a best selling Nike shoe. Um, you're not really, that's not really the point of it. The point of it is that if you get the opportunity to collaborate with a brand like Nike or you get the opportunity to collaborate with any sort of brand, a brand that you highly respect, you're better off sticking with your guns, going with something that you think is going to work for you, is, is your own vision, and dying by that sword than going with what they think, especially the marketing team or the advisors, who all mean well, but again, not, they don't have your vision. And then with, when, that's, when that fails, that's going to hurt even more. And if it succeeds, it's going to feel empty because it's, it's not really your idea. And most creatives, most true creatives, they, don't, they know when it's not their idea. They have, they, they're a bit embarrassed to claim it as their own, especially if they're being lauded or being supported. It's like, I didn't really do this. So it's better to die, die on your own sword, go with your own design, go with your gut, and hopefully it works out. Hopefully, you end up like Stefan Janowski. You get, you, know, you get a nice little pay packet out of it, or you end up going, in, going down in the Nike Wall Hall of Fame kind of thing. That sounds fucking amazing. I, I didn't know that. One of, the tops, one of the top 100 selling shoes. I wonder what the 100 selling shoes are. There might be some real、um, curveballs in that list, I'd imagine, right? I'd imagine Air Force Ones and all that sort of shit's going to be on there, you know,、um, standard. But I wonder what the kind of real. Odd ones might be. Maybe it's something like a Nike Epic,、uh, Air Max Lite. I don't think so because that retro was terrible. Maybe Air Trainer 1. I wonder what the 100 top selling shoes are. Anyway, another time. But yeah, that's a, that's a video out at the moment. I'm going to link it in the show notes. It's called Nike SB Stefan Janowski for daily use. I think they're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the shoe.、Um, so yeah,、um, definitely check that out. I'm sure they'll be having loads of activations around it too, probably to kind of celebrate that as well. But who knew who. Knows, probably check it out. Link in the show notes for those of you that care. Next on the list here, 
We have Nike Air Max 2000. No, sorry, Nike Air Max 270, 2000. Um, these are one of my favorite kind of new newer models that have come out at the moment. I know I complain a lot on here sometimes about the prevalence of retro, especially from um, Nike. They love to kind of, you know, bang out the retros and not really make any newer, sh newer models or newer shapes. But I like the fact that this shoe kind of takes inspiration from some of the early 90s kind of, you know, shoes that we all know and love from Nike, but also updates into a modern looking kind of shoe. Um, again, really nice model. I love the paneling on the upper. I love the some the kind of translucent sort of sole. Sorry, the translucent upper here on the, at the top. I'm not sure if that's mesh or if that's flyer wire. Looks beautiful. I love the fact that most of the paneling now on Nike shoes has been, is it heat pressed or whatever? So there's, it's seamless. There's no stitching on it for the most part. I love that side of it. So real minimal stitching on the upper. Most of the panelings have been kind of glued together or heat pressed together. Um, I love this big fat bubble at the bottom as well. Um, 270 degrees. If I was being nitpicky, I'd say I'd want it to be a little bit more bulbous, but I think I think the reason why they don't do it is um, probably uh, similar to why you don't see Air Max 95s with the... Do you know those code.jp Air Max 95s? So let me see if I can find a picture of them, right? But there's a code.jp Air Max 95, right? Um, let me see if I can find them. Air Max 95 code JP. Hopefully someone's got a pair of them. You'll see how fat the bubbles are from back in the day. They don't make them as fat anymore. I'm pretty sure there was some, something to do with the PU or whatever, maybe... Um, let's do JP. The old school ones had a really fat bubble. I'm not sure if I can find them. I think that's the one here, but they don't really show them too often. Let's do vintage. Yeah, so as you can see, this is this is even a woman's one, right? So I'll get the shoe up here. So as you can see with this um, kid's um, Air Max 95, it's usually a smaller size. It doesn't have the air bubble at the front. But back in the day, the air bubble on the Air Max 95 used to bulge out as much as that. Back in the day, like really fat, so it'd protrude on the outside. This is one of my pet peeves when it comes to the Vapor Max. When you look down on it, because the bubble doesn't pop out it kind of um, tapers in so it kind of looks like you're not really walking on anything it reminds you of the front it reminds you of the back of like a nike shock that i would like if the shocks kind of like tampered out a little bit or chamfered out so they're a bit like that like a triangle from the back so that you can see them as you're walking down sort of similar to like a triple s or you know the alexander mcqueen kind of step stan smith it kind of pops out to the side a little bit so you can see that um so i'd prefer I'd, I'd like it if the bubble on the back of this 95 from here was maybe the same sort of bulbous nature as this on the a27 but again that's just nitpicking i think overall it's a really nice color teal green aqua green blue very minty very fresh um yeah it's a very very nice model if anything maybe the pull tab i'll change the color of the pull tab it shouldn't be black maybe that should be another brighter color maybe a neon green or something but yeah really nice colorway mesh on the inside so for those guys that like to have funky socks during the summer this will be a good shoe during the summer actually wear a pair of shorts um, you can get them. Oh, nice, really black and teal colorway here as well. It looks really, really nice. Reminds you of a, um, reminds me of a Air Rift from back in the day. That kind of sort of colorway looks really cool too. This aqua colorway looks really nice as well. Yeah, it's a really nice model overall. I think again for all the, for for the amount of complaints I have about retros, um, they've done a really cool job with these Air Max twenty sevens. Um, sorry, Air Max two seventies. They're out September twelfth. So a long time. Oh, really? They're gonna be? They're not even gonna be out in time for summer. That doesn't make much sense, is it? These are perfect shoes for summer. Why aren't they out for now? That's a bit of a... They dropped the ball on that one. These are perfect shoes for summer. These will sell really well if it's summertime. Surprised they're not bringing them out now. Okay, well, I guess you're going to have to dead stock them until next summer. Or if you're in the States, you'll probably have a good summer regardless. So, yeah, they're going to be out September 12th. The Hyper Jade and Blue Lagoon. Oh, sorry, no, so there you go. Hyper Jade and Blue Lagoon dropped July 18th. Okay, I'm about to say, it makes more sense. With the Electro Green, the one that's kind of black and yellow, dropping September 5th. Um, uh, but that's why this is September 12th. Okay, it doesn't matter. So yeah, they're coming out um, July 18th. So you only got to wait another month and you can be able to cop them. Really nice shoe there. Air Max 270 um, in free seasonal colorways. Check those out if you're that way inclined. Um, next on the list here, we have the Pater and Jordan F. Pattern and Jordan 7s. I, I think I mentioned these previously, but this is another colorway that came out as well, which looks really cool. I wasn't very understanding about the promotional items with this. A little please can't go by with this item, with this pair of shoes. I remember they were seeing a lookbook from Pata with Neymar in it. I don't know what that connection is. Maybe they're just friends. 
um, the pack crew know Neymar, whatever. Um, I'm not too sure where that connection came from, but you know, it's Nike. It could come from anywhere. But um, I like this. I think I prefer this colorway to the the one that's meant to be coming out. I'm not sure if this is a friends and family colorway. Let me just say here, back in May, we saw John Seven pattern to calibrate on a creamy beige alternative, courtesy of Hanzu Ying. We got a preview of an upcoming release dubbed the um, dubbed the what? The Isi, whatever that called. The upper is made of light blue leather. Is that light blue? A red Jumpman logo, Team Pata hits back. Although the official release date has yet to be announced, the Pata Jordan 7 expected to drop this month on the website too for $200. Okay, yeah, I quite like this colorway, man. I think I prefer it to the one that we see now. Um, the one that's going to come out is sort of like a burgundy brownie sort of colorway. Again, I would prefer it without the Pata logo on the midsole, but again, I understand what Pata are doing, you know. They have to appeal to the kids. The kids love what they do. So if they want, if the kids want, um, if the kids want a, if the kids want um, text on their midsole, they get text on their midsole. And for the most part, the upper looks pretty clean. I quite like them, man. Jordan 7s are probably one of the most underrated uh, Jordans, really, I think, in the oh, entire collection. People don't wear them enough. I remember my friend Marcus used to, wear these really really well dropped them amazing back in the day but people don't really drop these anymore but i really like the shoe man even the bot the sole looks really nice yeah i'm a, I'm a big fan of these jordan 7 the alternative color we're not sure if they're gonna come out i'm not sure if this is like a a hong kong uh, mock-up or something or if they're legit or not but i actually prefer these to the ones that are coming out recently which is these right these ones are meant to come out um in the next couple of days or they're out already it's sort of like a brownie sort of colorway. So yeah, I prefer the previous one to this personally. In my opinion, I think the other ones are better. But again, it's for you guys to make up. But yeah, Pat Jordan 7s out very, very soon. Check those out, your local Jordan retailer. Next on the list here, we have Hip Hop Millionaires. Who wants to be a millionaire? Who wants to be a millionaire? Million. So, list from Forbes. Detailing the next batch of hip hop's hip hop's next billionaire. I think after Jay Z was announced that he's the current billionaire, so you know some of those guys have a lot of catching up to do. And it's again, it's interesting the breakdown in terms of all this um, money and all that wealth in terms of in terms of the biggest acts. Most of it comes from outside of music, which again goes to show just how fucked up the whole music industry is in terms of how you can make money in that kind of industry. Um, but again, it shows a, a direct template for kids coming up about what you have to do if you then want to make the big bucks. No real excuses nowadays. There's so much information. So much information. And the good thing about these five guys um, featured here, Kanye West, P. Diddy, Drake, Jay-Z, and Dr. Dre, is that they all occupy different lanes in hip-hop. I think yesteryear, you probably only could have had one person leading a charge. One person is the one, one person kind of, you know, flying the flag. One person getting all the endorsements. But nowadays, maybe with the advent of the internet, and maybe would I wouldn't say so much so streaming. I say the internet has probably unlocked more opportunities for these guys outside of music than anything else. And obviously, with hip hop now becoming a cultural uh, movement outside of music, from taste to aesthetic to fashion to hair to clothes, it's now they're now able to kind of put their finger on different pieces of the pie, right? So people might not listen to Drake, but they want to drink the drink, the drink, drink drinks when he goes out. They might want to go in a nightclub or a shisha bar that he and his friends might frequent. So there's different avenues you can kind of appeal to without directly being people being fans of his music, going to his tours, buying his merch. A really cool um, thing. So Forbes has kind of broken it down. It's a short article I'll read to you now. Link in the show notes for, you, for, you guys, for those of you guys that are listening. So um, the article starts off with the title, Hip Hop's Next Billionaire, Richest Two Rappers 2019, written by a guy called Zach O'Malley. Um, so the, it starts off saying the following. Back in 2017, Jay-Z made a bold statement in a song about his lyrical prowess and future financial uh, fortunes. He has said the following, I'm already the GOAT. Next stop is a is the Billy. Uh, sure enough, Forbes declared him hip-hop's first billionaire. Early this month, the news caught the attention of observers around the world, not only due to the breadth of Jay-Z's financial achievement, but also because of what it meant for others looking for follow steps. Jay-Z entire life is a real blueprint says hip-hop pioneer Fat Five Freddy long-time host of the show UMTV Raps he's one of the first examples of our lifetime of one who's truly achieved the American dream and billionaire status of course especially if you know you know his humble beginnings on the Marcy projects um, naturally Jay-Z tops this year's ranking in hip-hop's richest um, stars um, who will be the next billionaire in the rap world the answer is almost certainly one of the names below so number five wealth in from what Forbes have declared um, Drake has a combined wealth of 150 million the 32 year old rapper is the youngest in the list by a decade. He's quickly gaining ground in hip hop's elder statement. Drake's fortune grew fifty percent over the past year, boosted by holdings in a range of real estates. Um, from real estate to his Virginia black whiskey. I want to review. Want to try that shit? I think I might do a review of that later. 
um, try everyone's liquor. Who doesn't have a liquor in that group? Uh, D- Jay Z's got one. Drake's got one. Diddy's got one. Dre doesn't have one, and Kanye doesn't have one. So I'll try these three liquors and do a little video of it coming up very soon. So he's got his Virginia Black. He's as well as a lucrative tour and new residency X X S nightclub in Las Vegas. Um, Kanye West is next 250, 240 million, which is amazing considering where he's come from and the financial struggles that he was talking about. Um, ba, 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 ba. He took the show by the road in Coachella, Sunday service, hawking socks. Despite declaring himself 53 million in debt, uh, beseeching Mark Zuckerberg for 1 million, but billion to fund his future endeavors. West makes his debut on his list thanks to a, another, another patron, Adas, which lured West from Nike. Um, our accounting on West's wealth is almost entirely predicted on the conservative estimate of his brand's value. As it continues to scale up, he could one day join his sister-in-law, Kai Jenner, as a billionaire. P. Diddy, of course, 740 million. Mamma mia. Yeah, the quote says, I started my business career at age 12 delivering newspapers, Diddy said. Um, since then, I've always understood that if I give the customer my best service um, and service them differently, whether music, drinking or vodka, um, I'll get a return on my hard work. The artist formerly known as Puff Daddy uh, dips to number three on the list as intro- as industry trends weigh on some of his holdings, including the cable network Revolt, of course, which is kind of stagnating a little bit, and clothing line Sean John, though Diddy has sold much of his stake of the latter and he retains a sizable piece. But Ciroc, the main driver of his fortune, is growing again. Yep, especially the new flavors they have now at the moment, watermelon and a few others I've seen people promote. I love the I love the um influences he's getting too. He's getting a lot of those like Instagram models to kind of advertise some of his stuff like that. Drea Girl, the India Love and a few other people doing adverts. I must have saw Christina Milian doing an advert too for it. I like how he's kind of allowing the influencers to do their own little pieces of content, similar to what Burt Kreischer does for his tour. So that's pretty cool. Um, imagine if Burt Kreischer drank some rock. That would be so awesome. He'd make some really good promotion, but he's only drinking Tito's and soda and shit, isn't it? Is Tito's a vodka? What is Tito's? I think Tito's is a vodka, isn't it? Tito. Tito's. What is that? Is that a vodka? Yeah, it's a vodka. So maybe you can drink that. If you met Pop Daddy once, that would be fucking awesome to see. But so rock the main driver's fortune, da, 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 blah blah. Number two, we've got Dr. Dre, hundred million. We know why what that's for. Any other things here? He gets system into our school, blah blah. And then number obviously number one, Jay Z with a billion. Jay Z looks awesome with the, with the dreads now, doesn't he? Yeah. So yeah, um, that's again. Here's a list of people. And again, th- this is like the new um, what do you call it? The new Mount Rushmore, isn't it, for hip hop kids and girls all around the world? So I guess if you're wanting to you know pursue your dreams and you're wanting to achieve higher things in life and reach for the stars without malarkey you only have to look at these guys look at their blueprint look at what they're doing and in general i always say especially people ask for advice and stuff i think the best advice you can get from people is following their actions see what they do not not don't listen to what they say follow their actions in your own little way interpret it how you like to apply it in your endeavors and then see where it takes you in it um the process is usually the most enjoyable thing about it anyway the money at the end is awesome but i think some of these most of these guys aren't really motivated by money um of course if you come from dire straits the money the aspect of like not being broke again is going to be something that's going to wrangle in your head but for the most part once you reach that level of financial freedom it's also become a bit of a game the process is fun you know starting from one mil and then trying to flip that to two or starting from one grand trying to flip that to ten that's all a big game that they like to do again and again and again so again follow the examples and who knows maybe you could be on that list too who knows who bloody knows next we have um first there was relatable youtubers now we have relatable mps okay i have to be honest i don't pay attention to politics i try to keep my nose out of those kind of things because i think sometimes having an interest in politics especially when you're young can sometimes be a distraction or you're sometimes purposely distracting yourself from dealing with the things in your life that need to be dealt with i would like to be a what do you call it a valuable member of society a contributing member of society i'd like to be a good friend to my friends a good partner a good brother a good son wherever it may be so i have many many things that i have to kind of plug up in my own life before i start you know um what you're trying to change the ills of the world but sometimes in this political sphere especially nowadays with the advent you know with since trump got elected in the states i think he kind of blew out the water any kind of formal conventions that we're used to the kind of politeness and you know the decorum and the kind of elder statesman and kind of you know real um you know, just relaxed nature of some leaders has kind of got thrown out the window. Now, the more uncouth, the more off the handle, the more you speak from the heart, the more you go with your gut type of thinking 
has now been praised. So if anything, Trump has basically changed the political landscape forever and ever, probably more so than he's ever realized. And you would say that why I think that is because this weird story of MPs now trying to be relatable, especially the Tory MPs, I think maybe because in the UK, they're mostly, you know, unrelatable. A lot of young kids don't, a lot of the young people in the UK don't, are not, don't really identify with Tories. It's usually used as a kind of a slur or an insult for people on YouTube and shit when they kind of accuse you of being a Tory. Um, you have to look at someone like Alfie Days. He's kind of been accused of that recently. Anyone kind of comes from a bit of an affluent background gets accused of being a Tory, which is kind of, you know, the you know, uh, the deepest cut you could get from some random on the internet. So in an effort to kind of um, curtail that and appear cool, some of these MPs are coming out and declaring or admitting the most wildest of things to become part of the kind of current zeitgeist conversation. And none more so than this weird clip that I saw the other day. Again, I'm really late on this, so forgive me, but I only really saw it the other day. It's from uh, Good Morning Britain with um, Piers Morgan and the other two lovely ladies. So they're interviewing this um, Tory MP candidate called Esther McVeigh who ended up finishing bottom of the list, which everyone was uh, gleefully happy about. I'm not sure why. I think maybe people don't really like her. But he listen to this first thing that she says when she's on the Great Britain show. <laughs> and then I'll play another clip that maybe explains why she went on and said this, right? Is, is have you ever taken cocaine? No, I haven't. <laughs> have you ever taken drugs at all? Oh, I've said uh, yesterday I'd tried uh, blow pot marijuana no. or whatever blows cocaine well then that's the wrong word not where i come from it wasn't oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going on why are these mps going on morning morning breakfast shows that are watched by like your mum and shit and you know regular regular people at home and admitting that they've done blow but it's not blow it was marijuana where in the uk do they call blow weed can someone tell me where that happens in the UK? Everyone knows blow, sniff, yak. <laughs> That's how you know she hasn't taken jack shit. And again, what's wrong with being a square? Now they're trying to be relatable. They want to be down with the kids. What next? Is she going to say she had a little hand style? She had a little throw she did back in the day? Right, a little tag? And you're going to find someone, someone from the team is going to go and tag up some random uh, pub or a restaurant somewhere in Kensington and get people to go take pictures of it and say that she was involved in graffiti back in the day. Like, what in the fuck is this? Like, what's happening? Like, so bizarre. She goes on morning TV and says, not where I come from. <laughs> Piers Morgan, well, blows cocaine. Piers knows, isn't it? Back in the day. <laughs> oh, these guys are crazy, man. What the hell are they doing? What the hell are they doing? And again, if you're wondering where that come from, you're wondering why then people would go on morning breakfast show and say that, worry not. Agostino's got all the answers for you, my dear friends. All the answers. So, this other MP called Michael Gove, who is probably one of the most punchable faces I've ever seen in my life, um, started this whole foray around admitting what drugs you're taking because look what happened with him. This is a report from Sky News. <laughs> Oh, God. Michael Gold has had his sights set on a promising future. Uh, I can confirm that I will be putting my name forward to be Prime Minister of this country. Look at that face. Doesn't he have the most punchable face you've seen in my life? I can't confirm. Oh. But it is his past that's getting attention right now. Such Mr. a square Gold's cocaine dog. admission comes right in the middle of his work for the <laughs> Mr. Gove told the Daily Mail, I took drugs on several occasions. But social Again, I'm not sure where this come up. Again, I haven't read the whole the whole piece, so please forgive me. I'm not sure if he got set up during the interview. They were talking about, you know, the, <laughs> the level of drug use in London with young kids. Maybe they were trying to talk about knife crime or talking about gang culture. And then somehow through that conversation, it came up, you know, what could you do? What could you talk? What's the message you have for kids? And you have sometimes maybe say, look, I was also a drug user, but look how I turned my life around. I don't know how this conversation came about, but this is just bizarre. For someone that looks the way he does, right? This square looking guy, right? I'm not sure why nowadays he's feeling like that. But again, I think it's the it's the effects of Trump. Trump has come in and been so bombastic, has been so successful in his brand of brashness and abrasiveness and saying what he wants and going off the cuff. Even Boris Johnson, who's been a bit of a doofus anyway, has really cranked up the levels of not giving a fuckedness over the last couple of years because of the success of Trump. People have seen that, you know, now they're in politics, people want to see the real you. They're not really caring about the, because I'm, I can't confirm, I will stand for the, they don't want all that sort of shit. They want someone that's honest and speaks from the heart, even if it is a bit contrived, even if it does, 
you know, it's a bit waffy, wafy, whatever it may be. They want someone that's going to speak honestly. So because of that, these MPs have like looked at the drawing board and be like, hmm, what can we do? I know. Let's admit I did some blow back in the day, which wasn't blow. It was actually weed, if you're Esther McVeigh. Or let's you know, admit that I, I, took, I, know, I bought a couple of bumps or whatever it may be. It's just a bizarre thing to say. And I love how he says more than 20 years ago. You know, you have to get that time period up. You have to get that right time period. Because if you declare it happened only a couple of months ago, you never, you never, you never know. They might open an investigation. It was more than two decades ago. <laughs> it was a mistake. I look back and think, I wish I hadn't done that. Members of the Conservative Party? Who know? says that? Who says back in the day when they did coke, they wish they'd never done it? Everyone that says done coke says they enjoy it, but it obviously ruins your life, so you have to stop at some point. But you never look back and say, oh my God, it was one of the worst time of my life. No, it wasn't. It was super enjoyable. You loved it, but you have to put a break on it if you want to achieve things and you want to pursue your dreams. You, you know, you can't be on the fucking sniff every single day. It's not going to really get you that far, right? Or if it is, it's going gonna to take you so far. So you quit for the sake of your career, for the sake of your family. But it's not like you're giving up because it's not yummy. It's definitely yummy. It's definitely enjoyable. <laughs> like people you'll often meet down the pub or similar um they'll have had different experiences in their own lives and but they're making a judgment on who they think can take the country through uh, yo if i'm again i don't know enough about politics but if i'm involving myself in politics i'm not i'm not voting for somebody that's done a bit of sniff or that's drank something or that's smoked some weed like that is the last thing on my mind I'm, I'm voting for your policies like what what do you stand for that's more so as opposed for your you know past what do i care that my MP used to be a DJ back in the day or went raving. Like, give a fuck. You know, what are you going to do for my local community? What the fuck is this? <laughs> Politics has turned into an absolute shit show. But yeah, maybe I'm late on that whole malarkey, but that really made me laugh, man. Yeah, I've done a bit of blow and, and weed. It's like, blows, blows cocaine. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, not where I come from. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> absolute legend, Esther McVeigh. Absolute legend. <laughs> Absolute legend. Anyway, let's move on. Um, what's next here? Um, Chernobyl, Chernobyl tourism. Another, another in another example of just how wacky this world has become. Influences around the world, or influences specifically, um, you know, in the, in the in Eastern Europe or near Ukraine, are now flocking to Chernobyl after the hit show on HBO and trying to take selfies of the now deserted Chernobyl. Um, again, not sure why, not sure why this is happening. It might be because they're getting the selfies off, but this is another example of just how demented some people are on social media, you know? Just just for the sake of getting off your likes, you're, you know, putting yourself at harm's way. Um, the levels of radiation in Chernobyl are still super high. You have to look at some recent documentaries, some videos of people that have been there recently with the, with the meter to go check it, and people are still going there and having no real not caring that much it's just like a bizarre state of affairs like what kind of selfie is this right you're in chernobyl and it's this girl with a selfie um and behind her is like a, a dilapidated car that's been burnt out and left for ruin and you're smiling like what does i have to what what what, what is that what, what's the caption on that kind of picture in chernobyl lols look at that car <laughs> no one's around where is everybody i don't know that's like what a doofus. But anyway, it's a record, report from BBC says the following. Tourists visiting Chernobyl must be respectful. They've created the HBO show um, about nuclear disaster. Said there says uh, some people visiting the site in Ukraine where the world's worst nuclear accident happened in 1986 have been taking pictures smiling at the abandoned power plant. One person posted a semi-naked picture. Craig Mazine said it's wonderful that a wave of people have been visiting. It's not really wonderful, really. I don't really know why you visit that kind of thing. Um, maybe similar to people that want to go to Auschwitz and stuff. It's a bit it's a bit perverse, a little bit macabre. I'm not sure why you'd want to go there, especially knowing the atrocities that happened there. You know what I mean? Like, Again, maybe it's people that love misery porn. That's probably the reason why. It's a bit strange for me. Uh, blah, blah. But he's asked people to remember that the terrible tragedy occurred. Their estimates of the number of people affected very hugely. Chernobyl Forum says fewer than 50 people died. Of course, we know it's more than that. And eventually went up to 9,000 deaths linked to the disaster. Uh, comfort. Uh, comport yourselves with respect to those who suffered and sacrificed. Craig wrote on Twitter. But look at these pictures of people like <laughs> Chernobyl taking pictures and shit. It's fucking bizarre. What a weird world we live in at the moment. A number of companies run tours. Uh, for the for the 300 exclusion zone around Chernobyl and 
Pripyat, the abandoned city that was built for Chernobyl workers and families. He had a population of 60,000 people before the disaster, but has been largely deserted ever since. Although an estimated 60,000 tourists visited there each year, the exclusion zone spreads from Ukraine and into Belarus and covers an area more than twice the size of London. Wow. Following the popular Sky Atlantic show, there has reportedly been an increase in tourism in the zone. Its landmarks now feature in the background of pictures on Instagram. Look at what people are doing, man. It's absolutely bizarre. This girl saying me naked here. There's a guy with a meter. Another girl wearing a white. Some girl leaning up on a, a burned out bus there. As we said, a number of people who died as a result of radiation is disputed. Official, yeah, the government says the end of, at the end of the show, if you watch it, they say about 30 people have died, but, you know, we know it's more in the thousands. At two, a 2000 report from Chernobyl Forum suggested that fewer than 50 people died, but, also, but it also estimated that up to 9,000 people could eventually die. Greenpeace puts the figure as high as 93,000. What's not disputed is there are around 5,000 cases of thyroid cancer, most of which were treated and cured, were caused by the radi contamination. That was Chernobyl's writer wants people to remember. Mama mia. And look at people going there. Just, it's just a really freaky thing. Auschwitz is the same sort of thing. When you come to Auschwitz, remember you are on a site where one million people were killed. Respect their memory. It's like people that take pictures of that um, 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 money, the memorial in Berlin, the massive blocks, and they stand on it and they take pictures of people that fuck on the side of it or kiss and stuff. It's like people are weird. Some bizarre individuals on social media, but you know, I guess that's what kind of gets their rocks off. What can you do? But yeah, um, I guess be respectful, man, if you can. Uh, maybe not if you like this guy and you want to smile, Sir Guy, uh, Sir Sir Gay, or whatever his name is. Well done, dude. Mamma mia, some people are just, I don't know, you really wonder with some human beings, isn't it? You really wonder. Anyway, what's next on the list here? Um, site Pacific Intelligence. Yes, this is Site Pacific Intelligence. I think I need to read a book about it. There's one guy, I think his name is Gardner something. He speaks about intelligence or the varying levels of intelligence. And I want to read it because of this story specifically. So it's really funny that I'm reading it because of that. But there's this story about Kylie Jenner um, doing a Hands May Tell theme party. And it kind of made, really made me think that there are different levels of intelligence because, you know, as we are aware, Kylie Jenner is a billionaire. Um, she's got a very profitable cosmetics line. Now she's put out a skincare line. She's got make, no, cosmetics, is that cosmetics makeup? Anyway, she's got skincare, makeup. Um, she also has her endorsements with Fashion Nova and all these kind of things. You know, she's raking in the money. She's doing very, very well for herself. So there is a part of her that's extremely intelligent that's able to kind of, you know, some people would dispute it and say she comes from a rich family, but... I'd really, I do think there is some talent in the ability of taking someone's money, even if you are rich, and turning it into more money, right? Because we know spending money is easier than making it. Um, so she's been able to do that. But recently she had a party for her friends, with her friends, I guess, because uh, for the premiere of season two of Hands May Tell, one of the best shows out at the moment, but also a show that doesn't necessarily um, call for people to celebrate the protagonist in that respect right it's not really sure to kind of it's not like a game of thrones thing where you're celebrating people in there there's something triumphant about it it really does talk about you know this real um crazy dystopian future where women are being suppressed and it's effectively being traded around the world like cattle in order to repopulate the earth due to an outbreak that's kind of caused um famine around the country around the world and it's weird circ weird cultish group have now kind of taken control and it follows the you know the tale of this woman who's kind of trying to fight back so essentially it's not something to really celebrate because you know that hands may tell outfit represents a lot of oppression um and but kylie jenner and her friends have kind of seen it as a form of liberation which is really interesting to say the least but this is a story from cosmopolitan um it says um wondering how the cast of hulu hand may tell feel about kylie jenner's uh, party not great guys as a reminder our girl kylie inexplicably threw a hand may tell theme party for her best friend stacy and it got a lot of amount of backlash online the party featured a show signature costumes complete with white bonnets and Gilead flags as decor. Kylie Jenner even hired a bunch of random actors to cosplay as Martha's and welcome guests. Mama mia, man. Imagine being an, a, a mum and doing that and watch. Imagine, that's what I'm saying, the level of intelligence. I think watching Hands May Tell, because again, I, I, watch, I try to watch Hands May Tell with the brunette and she doesn't want to watch it anymore. It's too distressing, right? Most girls find it difficult to watch Hands May Tell. You have to go and you have to go on Twitter and follow some feminists who are really against Hands May Tell. They think it goes a bit too far. They don't like watching it. But again, because it's such a good show, it does such a good show. It's a good way of portraying that kind of, you know, the crazy bleak future for women if that ever was to happen, which it won't happen, fingers crossed. But you don't necessarily watch that show and leave it empowered or feel as if like you should 
that outfit is somehow empowering. Like, but it's weird that there's someone out there in the world who kind of sees that show and thinks, oh my God, the outfits are so cute. That's the first message in your head. It's so cute. Instead of taking some lessons from what the show is depicting and maybe trying to play it to your life, you think about how cute the outfits look, which they don't really look that cute, to be fair. They look quite harrowing, right? <laughs> they have no personality. There's this uniform. They have to have their heads down. There's armoured guards all over the place looking at them, watching their every move. Um, da, 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 da. Obviously, the cast of Hamei's tail should probably expect to be asked about this event and during every single interview that they give. And it's going down... It's, it's going down with Bradley Whitford. The actor who plays Commander Lawrence was asked about Kylie's party during an interview. CBS, so yes, he says, I don't know, man. Seems a bit tacky, which of course it is. You know, that costume is so kind of iconic and it's interesting how it's changed from initially a sort of symbol of oppression to now as the show is moving ahead, a symbol of resistance. So yeah, cocktail party seems sort of a dash, uh, a sort of a dash at all of significance. Cool. That's what I think as well. Um, looks like the internet goes agrees to the take. The tweets ranging from women's bodies get policed on a daily. Some states are trying to uh, ban abortion, yet Kylie thought that the Handmaid's Tale party was a good idea. Again, I'm really interested to read that book. Um, I forgot the name of it. It's on my list of uh, books that I want to read. Let me see if I can get it up here in a moment. So for you guys, I want to check it out. But I think ever since I've seen this, I really do think there is varying levels of intelligence. Um, some people just have it in different fields, right? It's, it's like sport, sport specific intelligence kind of thing um i'm not sure why i've got it where is it man let me see if i can find it my wish list if i got it here if i can log in uh where is it it's gardener something gardener no there we go yeah uh howard gardener and i think it's called five not five rounds of future yeah there we go frames of mind theory of multiple intelligences it's by Howard Gardner. I'm definitely going to check that out because I think I think Kylie kind of falls into that bracket. She's definitely not the most sharpest tool in the box, but she knows how to make a bunch of money and make girls wear the stuff that she wears or, you know, essentially drive trends, whatever it may be. But when it comes to social intelligence, whatever it may be, not the sharpest tool in the box. Or maybe she is. Maybe she's a thought leader in that respect and we're going to see Bear Girls wearing this during Halloween. But it's a really strange outfit to wear, I think, in the long run. Anyway, that's an hour. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys. I'll see you guys again next week because I'm off this weekend going to the old um, Gay Paris. So for you guys um, that are here, um, wish me luck and safe travels on that malarkey. Uh, and yeah, as per usual, check out my link in the show notes below for my stuff. I'm DJing, I think, on the 29th in Heathcote. In, no, sorry, at the Free Compasses in Dawson. So check me out there for my night called Bump. And you'll find out on all places where you find events such as Resident Vibes and stuff. But yeah, Free uh, free compass is 29th of uh of june and apart from that i'm probably back at tapis next week friday 21st so check out there if you're around but until then take care guys and see you again very very soon bye